we want to go ahead and bring in uh, Cassie Therfelder. She is the uh, lawyer, but also the director of advocacy and government relations uh, for the United Way here in Southeast Michigan. And we know United Way, Cassie, has been such a vital, vital organization to the area throughout this crisis. Uh, yes, thank you, Ronnie. I'm I'm really excited to be here with you today and talk about um, you know the Alice Report and some of the things United Way is doing. But you know, as we're talking about the COVID um, pandemic, you're right. Like um, we didn't expect it to go on this long. Uh, when when COVID first began, we immediately started our COVID nineteen relief fund, um, expecting that to only go for a few weeks, a few months, and then now you know we've been working. Um, for over a year to try to support households as we experience this both health and economic crisis. So with that, Cassie, um, we also know that United Way uh, is a nonprofit as well. And so what's it been like on the fundraising side? Because you're trying to help as many people, but also you need the donations to keep it going. Yes, absolutely. That's a really great question. Um, you know, we're seeing that our nonprofit partners throughout the region are are struggling. Um, there's been such a, a great increase in demand for the needs that these nonprofit partners are providing. Um, and they're also seeing that, you know, some of their donations are decreasing because people don't have um, as much flexibility in their income to give to nonprofit organizations. Um, but we are, you know, continuing to uh, provide funds and to receive funds thanks to some really incredible donors who are uh, helping support these, these needs. And so since the beginning of the pandemic, we have been able to award more than $35 million in grants throughout the region, which helps support nonprofit organizations and communities that are providing resources to those who are you know, living below the Alice threshold, struggling to get by. And um, we have also been able to provide uh, more than 350,000 items of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. And um, if you're not familiar with our 211 call center, this is a, you know, it's a it's a helpline. So it's a, a if you're experiencing any sort of crisis that's non-medical um, in nature, you can call this 21. You can call 211 and um, be connected to a community care advocate who will connect you to any services that. Uh, services, programs, resources that you're eligible for to help you with that crisis, whether that's, you know, the threat of eviction, or maybe you need to access to diapers or food for your household, um, really anything, we will connect you to the services that you're eligible for. And so we've made more than 93,000 connections um, for through 2 on one since the beginning of the pandemic. And we know that even with all of this, that's that's still not enough. So there are still nonprofits that are desperately in need of funds in order to provide the services people are in need of. And um, you know, there are more calls to one one all the time, uh, people who need services, um, who may or may not be eligible for services in their region. So um, it's it's definitely a struggle. And we're seeing seeing that need continuing to increase. 93,000. That number is really quite staggering. Um, yes. and, and that's just the ones that reached out. You wonder how many other people have not done so. Uh, during this time. Um, I do know you're also the director for the advocacy and government relations. And I want to talk to you more about the Alice report. And um, for those that aren't familiar with it, give us some background. Yes. So the Alice report is a report that's issued every two years by the Michigan Association of United Ways. It stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. Uh, United Ways throughout the country started recognizing that people in our communities were really struggling to make ends meet. But many of these people were working, they were doing everything right, and they still couldn't afford their basic household necessities. So we knew that the federal poverty level just wasn't telling us the whole story. Um, and the ALS report comes out of that. So the ALS report really shines a light on the challenges many households are facing and aims to find collaborative solutions to those challenges. Uh, the report uses a standard methodology to assess the actual cost of living or the actual cost of meeting your most basic needs in every county so that we can really have a measure of financial hardship throughout the state and break that down at the local level. Um, so the ELS report looks at key factors for a household's basic needs of food, housing, childcare, healthcare, transportation, technology, and taxes. 
Um, and we use that to build a bare bones budget. So a really the, the truest bare bones budget we can in order to understand the absolute minimum co uh, cost for a household to meet all of their needs. And that amount is referred to as the Alice survivability threshold. So that's the amount that a household must earn in order to meet all their needs. So that doesn't include any flexibility for saving for emergencies, for medical expenses, for any sort of, of crisis your family might experience. So there's, there's really no flexibility there. It's really just that bare bones minimum in order to survive. This is really vital. This is it, such important information because we do know there are so many people that are working full time. They're taking on second jobs and they're still not able to pay that light bill some some months. So with that, what do you do with this information? What's the next step? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So, um, you know, we are really doing our best to get the word out about the support. We want to help people understand um, why that is, why it is that so many people are often working two jobs um, and they're barely treading water they're not able to make all of their meet all their households needs um so uh we, we we share this information with the public but we also talk to our elected officials about this data we want them to know what the report says and um, what this means for their community as well so they can use this to inform their decisions about policy issues that will impact households below the house threshold um, and one of the things we really like to help make sure our um, elected officials understand is, you know, when, when we're looking at services and benefits that support households in need, we're often using the federal poverty level to determine whether you are eligible, whether you can qualify for those supports. <clears throat> so um, we're able to show that, you know, we have this actual cost of living developed by the Alice threshold or, or developed by the Alice report, um, that we can really understand what that cost of living is in our region. Um, whereas the federal poverty level <clears throat> is created by comparing pre-tax cash income against the cost of the minimum food diet in 1963, updated for inflation. So the federal poverty level is not taking into consideration any actual cost of meeting your household needs. And it doesn't vary based on where you live. And we know that the cost of living, cost of meeting your needs is gonna is going to vary wildly throughout the, the country and throughout our state as well. So um, being able to help explain that to um, you know people who are making decisions about policies and about who's eligible for programs can uh, really help um, understand why so many people above that federal poverty level are in, in need of supports as well. Um, you know, for example, <clears throat> the federal poverty level tells us that a family of four, um, the federal poverty level for a family of four is just over twenty eight thousand dollars. But according to the Alice report, that survivability threshold for that same family of four is actually uh, $64,000. That's more than double the federal poverty level. And that's the gap that we are really advocating for, right? So we know that there are households who are living below that threshold, they're working, they're doing everything right, and um, they're still not able to meet their needs. And this, this helps us understand why. We're talking with uh, Casey Therfelder. She is the director for the advocacy and government relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. And we're talking about the Alice report, such an important report. Uh, any new surprises with this latest report versus some of the previous years? Because we should remember too, this doesn't, this is before the pandemic. Yes. So um, I think there are a couple of really interesting facts. So, um, you know, First, like you said, this this report is from is from data from before the pandemic. So the report uses, in order to be as accurate as possible, it uses data that's two years old. So this is data from 2019. That's right before the pandemic began, and um, so that means uh, that this is this is when people. Uh, this is before the pandemic started. So this is also 10 years after we had experienced. Um, economic growth and recovery, right? We had 10 years of, of economic growth and recovery. We were, we were celebrating a strong economy, low unemployment rates. And right before the pandemic, 38% of households in the state, 38% weren't able to meet all of their basic needs. And so you can only imagine now um, after the pandemic has begun, what that might look like, how many more households are in need. Um, you know, this report, though, also does include a couple of interesting new new um, factors. So it includes a senior survival budget, and it also includes something called the Alice Essentials Index. So um, these are two new pieces for this report. 
And all of this information can be found on the data center at unitedforalice.org um, if you're interested in learning more about this data. Um, but the senior survival budget is um, a breakdown of what it costs for a senior to meet all of their needs. So someone who's over the age of 65 and it adjusts the household survival budget to reflect some of the different expenses or lower costs for seniors. And so what we found is that in 2019, nearly half of all seniors, 65 and older, were living below that Alice threshold. So that means that nearly half of our seniors aren't able to make ends meet. They're making those tough decisions about, you know, skipping a meal and not paying, not, not picking up their prescriptions. Um, and so these are, are things that we really need to consider um, when we're making decisions about, um, you know, policy decisions. And, um, you know, the Alice Essentials Index is that other new piece for this report. And I think this is a really interesting piece because this Essentials Index measures the change over time in the cost of household essentials uh, versus the Consumer Price Index, which tracks the prices over time on all goods and services. So when we look at just the goods and services that people need to survive, that households absolutely need um, their basic necessities, we see that these essentials increased at a rate of 3.4% annually over the past decade, whereas the consumer's price index inflation was only 1.8%. So um, we're seeing that the cost of goods and services that people need for their household to get by is increasing at a faster rate than other goods and services. And that helps us to understand also, you know, why, why there are so many people who are living below that threshold. We're talking with Cassie Therfelder with us. She is the Director for Advocacy and Government Relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. And with that, Cassie, are you, is the hope and the goal that our elected leaders will take this information and when they are making some of these policies around qualifications for goods and services, that this number comes into play? Because we do know there are some people that want to work, but they almost make too much to get services, but they're not making enough to actually make their ends meet. Yes, absolutely. That is definitely one of the things we want elected officials to consider, um, decision makers to consider. Um, that what you're talking about is that benefit cliff that we hear about all the time, right? Where you know people get to a certain point, they're making more, and then they lose some of those safety net supports that they need, um, and then they're not able to keep working. And so there are, in addition to considering, you know, Alice threshold um, as um, the eligibility level for, for a lot of these support services, um, which we know can help families who are living below the Alice threshold. There are a number of other ways that we can support Alice households um, through, through policy changes. And those are things that we know support, help support that budget, help reduce the burden on Alice families. These are things like um, the earned income tax credit, for example, which we know in 2011 was cut from 20% down to 6% of the federal EITC. So if we increase the EITC back to its original 20%, that puts more dollars in the pockets of, of working Alice households, households that are struggling to get by. Um, so things like that can help you know, ease that burden, that financial burden on households. Another example is, is childcare. So we know that childcare is consistently the highest cost for a family or household with children's budget. So that is true in every county in the state of Michigan. Um, and we know that access to high quality early education is so essential for children to be set up to succeed um, for their whole lives. And so we wanna make sure that everyone can access high quality, affordable early education and childcare. Um, and this is also a workforce issue, right? Because if you don't have access to affordable childcare, it can be difficult for you to work. Um, you know, it's, it, it's difficult for parents to make the decision to, to go work a job that barely pays enough to cover the cost of a child care bill. Um, and so that is something that we definitely ad, we want to advocate around is how can we reduce the cost of child care? How can we make child care more affordable for households throughout our region? But also taking into consideration that those, those individuals who are providing that care, that education, that essential service, for our um, households, those child care providers are often living below the Alice threshold themselves. So also looking at like increasing reimbursement rates to make sure that providers themselves are, are lifted up above that Alice threshold. Um, so there are a number of different pieces, different ways that we advocate around this Alice report. 
So in putting the Alice report together, you have the information, you recognize the problems. Does it also offer advice or guidance on the solutions or do we just start with at least identifying the shortcomings in our communities? So the report itself is more about providing that data that information so that everyone in our community can take that information and make those decisions about you know, what those next steps should be. Um, and I'll say, you know, United Ways throughout the state are, are doing that as well. They're looking at this data and thinking about, you know, how can we use this to inform our decisions about things like grant making and our strategic initiatives, our programs, our services, what we're doing um, to improve the lives of those living below the Alice threshold. Um, so the report itself does not in really include any of those, you know, policy recommendations. But you know, United Ways across the state do have those policy recommendations, and you, know, you can you can see more about our policy perspectives, the things that we're advocating on around Alice households by visiting StandWithUnitedWay.org. Uh, we have a, you know all of our policy initiatives included there as well. We're talking with uh, Cassie Therfelder. She is the director of advocacy and government relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. And uh, I think a lot of people in the community can recognize that there is a need and there is a gap, but some people are going to say opportunities are available for people to lift themselves up to get out of this situation. What's your response to that? I think a lot of times when we're looking at this Alice data, our initial reaction is to say, well, what we need to do is increase opportunities to higher paying jobs. Um, but from this Alice report, what we know is that more than half of all jobs in Michigan are paid hourly, and more than half of these jobs, of all jobs, pay less than $20 an hour. So there are opportunities for employment, but not necessarily opportunities for employment to put you above that Alice threshold. Um, we know that before, you know, before the pandemic began, only 25% of all working age adults had the security of a full-time salaried position. And so that put them at this great risk when entering, you know, the pandemic. Um, so I think keeping in mind that, you know, there are definitely opportunities for us to, to support these households um, as they work to, to, you know, get new credentials or skills training, um, increase their degree attainment. Um, but for many of these households, there are barriers for things like childcare, transportation. Um, and so providing wraparound services to help support households in accessing those programs is really essential, but also recognizing that, again, you know, more than half of all jobs in Michigan are paying less than $20 an hour. And that is not enough to sustain, you know, a household budget. It's so true. Housing uh, in the area, especially around Detroit, is so expensive. I remember I went to college down south and when I first came up to Detroit, I was like just sticker shocked at the cost of housing, which we know is such a huge part of people's budget. But uh, one of the things too, I, I really wonder, um, it's going to be fascinating to see this report in two years with the pandemic because we do know so many people have been forced out of the workforce because of remote learning with their kids. And we know that now we need uh, some of those vital tools include the internet and computers. And, you know, women have left the workforce at a higher rate than men. So now is a great time for this report to come out and really get our policymakers to pay attention to it. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, we're, we're very interested to see what impact COVID has had on our region um, in that next report. In the meantime, we do have some information about how households who are below the Alice threshold are impacted by COVID. Um, we know that, you know, these are households that many of them have, many of whom have children um, that didn't fully recover from the Great Recession. As we talked about, you know, costs are rising faster than wages, and all of our wages, and many of our wages are concentrated in those low wage jobs um, and jobs that more often do not include health benefits or sick time. And so, you know, Alice households are more vulnerable to crises of all kinds from, you know, natural disasters to this current pandemic because they aren't able to have that financial cushion, that financial safety net. Um, and that is what's needed um, when you go into a crisis like this pandemic. And we also know that, you know, these, 
many of these Alice households are people who are on the, the tightest budgets and they're navigating that complex web of benefits and eligibility. And they're working multiple jobs in many cases just to tread water. And these are the same COVID-19 essential workers who are stocking grocery shelves. They're making and delivering food, keeping essential municipal services running and caring for our loved ones. Um, and what's really interesting is, is if you visit uh, unitedforalice.org, you can see uh, the COVID-19 data overlapped on the Alice uh, data as well and really see how um, COVID-19 is specifically impacting Alice households. Cassie Therfelder with us here on the Mega Cast. She's the Director in Advocacy and Government Relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. Uh, fascinating work and very important work as well, Cassie. And we know United Way has been, again, such an important part of the community in helping so many people, not just in the pandemic, but uh, previously for decades as well. Anything maybe I didn't touch on that you want to add before we say goodbye to you? Um. Now, I think I just want to, you know, say that I know that this data, you know, can be um, heartening, uh, but hope is not lost, and there are ways that together we can we can make an impact. We can do something about this. So um, make sure to share this information with people you know. Tell your elected officials your story. Let them know what policies are creating barriers for you, and you know what issues you're experiencing. Um, and again, you can you can join United Way's efforts to share this important information and these policy issues with our elected officials by visiting standwithunitedway.org. We have to recognize the problem before we can fix the problem. So Cassie, thank you for all your work on this as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today.